We are Myth Vision and Gnostic Informant. What is up, brother? You are about to say true Gnosis. <laughs> I love the little coin phrases. They're cheesy, but they do the job. People start to people start realizing, like, all right, I've had a lot of people comment and say, you know, I don't know why, but every time he does his intro, I'm like, we are. My wife's looking at me like, what the heck is wrong with you? <laughs> So uh, finally, a, a show with just you and me, just you and me. We're going to dig into what happened. What happened, bro? Oh, you man. Know? So, yeah. You want me to- well, I mean, we're, let's 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 work our way into this thing, because right. I think that like an onion, you peel back each layer and every layer causes you to tear up. OK, so you have to. You have to take it slow because we could just go, well, one day I woke up, um, ate a bad piece of breakfast and uh, I'm an atheist now, or I don't believe in a God, or I'm not sure if there is one or whatever. That did not happen like that. There was a, it was gradual. It's like evolution, a process that takes place. And we mutated to the information. We found a way to land the plane. So tell us, I want to ask you, first of all, before we get started, What's your YouTube channel about for our audience? Most of my audience knows you, but some people may not. Gnostic Informant is my channel. It is all about the history of the Bible, ancient ancient Rome, ancient Judea, ancient history in general, philosophy, um, just like some counter-apologetic stuff in there. A little bit of everything. Some science. You see Lawrence Cross right there on top, Bart Ehrman. Mm-hmm. I just did a video of Crecken Ford. Heathen Queen, that was a really good one. I'm um, all over the place. Just it yeah. is. It's just a channel full of Bible history, all the fun stuff. Yeah. So I, I pinned that in the comment section. Go ahead and subscribe periodically. If we get a mod in here who might be in here now, uh, please, if you would uh, share his link, just so people who are tuning in will subscribe. Neil's a friend of mine. We met this past year, actually. And uh, we'll explain that as we go along. In fact, it might be part of his journey uh, out, you know, uh, to where he is today, where you can actually ask questions and follow whatever evidence that is, even if that means there's something out there. I I encourage anyone to find that out and uh, whatever path they take. He also has a a Patreon. Consider helping support the guy. He's doing this full time now. So we're both trying to bring this information. There's just not too many channels out there that are doing these kinds of things. So consider helping support him on Patreon if you really want true gnosis. And then, of course, Myth Vision Patreon. I always plug this. I mean, I've just dropped some really fascinating videos my Patreon members are extremely excited about. There's just a lot of good stuff. The Real Origins of Islam, Peter Von Sievers, amazing episode. This one was Lester L. Graby, and he's like a Hebrew Bible professor. He's a... He's a badass when it comes to information and anyway, you can help support us there, but enough about us in terms of plugs. I I just, I want to know background here and that will help me better understand where you're coming from compared to where I did. Um, (laughs) So we got super chat, but we'll get to the super chats here in a minute. I want to get us started in this episode. I really do appreciate the support and everybody in the chat. I see digital Hammurabi in here as well. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. He's, he's literally, he's teasing us, everybody. I know it's Josh. (laughs) Megan doesn't do this kind of crap. What is the channel about? It's about being unable to ground the fundamental ultimacy of the necessary preconditions of impossible possibilities of the impossible silly atheism. (laughs) (laughs) I love you, Josh. I do love you. Um, Neil, where did you come from? Where did you go? Where did you come from? Cotton Eye Joe? So I was actually, I was actually growing up in a not fundamentalist family. It was one of those Catholic families. Mom's Italian. You know, we just like went to church twice a year. One of those type of, you know, normal, not <laughs> fundamental Christian family. But, you know, not nobody was serious or anything. I had one uncle who was a born again Christian who was like trying to convert everybody. But that's it. But um, growing up, always getting into trouble all the time. Got into heavy drug use. You know, kept getting in trouble with the law. Um, I always was a spiritual person. I always leaned that way. Right. Mm -hmm. I always thought there was something. And then I had a lot of, uh, phases where I, where I would, um, dabble with hallucinogenics 
like DMT, LSD, stuff like that. So that was like, you know how that goes. We're not going to do that. That sort of plays into like this whole, we're all one, man. Like, well, you know, you get that mindset. But um, it wasn't until I wound up in prison for possession that I read the Bible cover to cover. And that is what grabbed me because I was in there at a low point in life. Hopeless. Right. And you're, I'm reading these parables about the son who was who spent all his money in a faraway land. He went back to the father and he repented and everything's all good. And like that could, that, they're speaking to me. This is all about me. Right. So I didn't, it's not like I got out and went right to church. Like I had my little tumbles and stuff like that. But after a couple of years, parole and all that, after I like eased into becoming a fundamentalist Christian, which I did become like I was church three times a week. I was there more than everybody besides the pastor. I was the guy who would show up early with the keys. I had the keys. I did the, I turned everything on, the lights on. I was the guy who fucking recorded the, uh, I got the live streams going there. I was like into it. I mean, mm-hmm. you can look at my Facebook page and there's like pictures in there of me, like behind the scenes in the church doing my thing. Anyways. Um, I so want you were ser- So you were, you were, Absolutely serious. Absolutely. Um, in light of your hopeless state in prison and not having anything but time on your hands to exercise and read, and you're taking the time to read your Bible. How old were you when this was going on, and how old are you now? I turned 21 upstate in New York State Prison. Okay. So I'm, you were 21 I'm years 30, of age. I'm 32 now. So this was this was years back. Right, right, right. I, I want to give us yeah, yeah. I no, want people I, to I, see what's going on time wise and yeah, stuff at the same yeah. time. No, that's good. That's good. So so yeah, I cleaned up my life, you know, you know, spirituality. I'll, I'll, I'll be the first one to say it. spirituality. I was always, you know, I, you know, I went to the meetings too, the 12 step thing. So it all, it all played into each other, mm-hmm. counseling, this, that, and the third cleaned everything up. Right. And I'm at this church and I wanted it to be true so bad because what Christianity gave me was something to make me feel special. Right. Mm-hmm. So everyone else that I, went to school with is getting married, starting businesses, you know, they have good jobs, they're buying houses and I'm, I'm back at square zero, that negative 10, like I'm back doing nothing. Right. Right. But you do have a mansion in heaven and they don't. So, you know, so they, (laughs) I'm so glad you said that because here I am reading the text and it's like, don't worry about this world, lay up treasures in heaven. Right. You hear Mm -hmm. things like that. And then Christianity gave me something that I can say, everyone is foolish except for me. I have the truth. I'm going to heaven. They're all going to hell. They're all lost. They're all brainwashed, right? So I went down that path being like the typical American evangelical right wing, you know, the Trumpian types. Like, you know, I was, I was in that crowd. Mm-hmm. I had a pastor that said, I'm my faith. It's all about faith. It's not about works. The Catholic church is the church, of the devil. He would say, if I kill myself right now and kill all of you with an AK 47, I saw that he said, I can wake up in heaven because of my faith. Cause I have the right faith and I have the right Bible. King James Bible only. That's the type of church I was at. So I wanted this to be true so bad. Like there was, I did a, an opposite of what Lee Strobel says, where he says he want he was an atheist, didn't want it to be true. And then ended up like, being a detective and finding out that it was no way I did the opposite of that. I wanted it to be, I'm begging for it to be true. Like, let me find this out to be true. I'm going to prove that it's true. I'm going to go and study all the ancient history. I'm going to start learning Hebrew. I'm not even joking. I'm learning Hebrew. I had my friend at church with flashcards. In fact, and you're just a lay person doing this. So you're, you're definitely interested happens to me. I was moving boxes around and these were, these were in them. These are the Hebrew, the Hebrew. Oh, awesome. Text. Awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm learning Hebrew. I'm learning the Masoretic. I'm, I want to compare the Masoretic text to the King James Bible. Holy shit. Was that a revelation? I'm finding out the King James Bible's flawed. That was the first brick that fell. Okay. I, 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 I put in the, I, we're going to chip away at this. This is yeah. great. I want us to take it slow because this is, I want people to see the thinking behind it. And you can psychoanalyze us along the way in the comment section if you want, but that's fine. I want to make the point, I put it in the description that the bubble, right? We There is this bubble 
an all-inclusive dogmatic truth. They teach you that we have the truth. And what they're saying is true um, dogmatically. So when you start to find out that something isn't true, I hear this all the time. They go, fundamentalists make the greatest atheist. In fact, uh, a lot of Christians that are liberal are like, you know what? Uh, fundamentalism, they have as much a problem with fundamentalism as atheists do, they say. And they blame fundamentalists for making atheists. And they go, but they're, but see, the fundamentalists are wrong because they're throwing the baby out in the bathwater. We're going to get into this, but I honestly believe psychologically, as extreme as you are, and I can tell you're extreme like I am, we were willing to ask questions that the liberal who's found a way to kind of uh, figure things out with problems, discrepancies, contradictions, issues, all of that. And they're totally fine with nuance and uh, failed apocalypse. He probably got that wrong. Like, like I can't live in that world thinking that that's the case without actually starting from skepticism and finding out what's true. So there was this, there was this, something's going to shift in your mind. And I want people to see this. I can already tell it's going there. Right. You find out the King James Bible is not what your pastor told you. Right. So that, Close more. that so, okay. So that's the, the, the crazy part is instead of being like, okay, the King James Bible is not perfect. This whole church is false. I got to leave. I just went to a different church. I went to a, um, mm -hmm. um, what do you call it? The, uh, the, the speaking in tongues. Um, what, what the hell is that? Church? Charismatic, uh, yeah, Pentecostal, like, Pentecostal, or, yeah, Pentecostal. Or non uh, I'm not even joking. This was a Puerto Rican. This was a, Spanish slash he, the the pastor, great guy, Pastor Juan. He would do Spanish, and his wife would translate it in English. Mm -hmm. And I thought I didn't care what the that I was the odd man. Now everyone there speaking Spanish. I'm in the middle of the west side of Buffalo in the hood. I thought this was the real church because I'm like, this is where the spirit is. This is the real. This is it. Um. So I did that for a little bit, mm -hmm. and I actually got rebaptized. I'm not. This is a true story. I'd never told anyone this. I wanted this to be true so bad, right? right. So then I, I then I got to the point where maybe it's not about the text. It's about the Greek. It's about the Hebrew. It's who cares about King James only. I'm done with that now. I'm at this new church. In fact, I'm going to reestablish my faith. I'm going to get baptized again. And I remember being like, God, I'm doing this right now. I'm going to get baptized. Give me the spirit again. Mm -hmm. I, and that was the last day I went to church. That day I got baptized. The last day I went to church. Okay. Last day you went to church, you got baptized. Yep. Never went to church ever again. And and let me let me take us slow here as we get into this because I'm gonna maybe relay back to me and where I came from. When I started finding problems, it wasn't overnight. It was all within Christian discussion that caused me to start seeing problems. And every time I examined a new doctrine or considered new ideas. I would get rebuked by someone in the church or someone online as a Christian, a part of a Christian Facebook group or whatever. Facebook was around when I deconverted. And they'd say, you're going to and fro with the wind, every doctrine. You're not grounded in the truth. And I'm thinking, like, literally in my head, I'm aware of these things even more than these people making these accusations. And they, they're they starting with a presuppositional approach. I I got the truth. I'm right. Since you're not actually getting into my area of what I'm thinking, you're like the wind going to and fro because you haven't stuck to one doctrine. So there's there's a lot here to get into. But since that was your last day, what happened? Were you investigating something? Were you researching? Did you come across a certain video? Did Is there anything in particular that yeah. started to cause you to stop going to church? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually, because after, the, after that King James only thing fell that's when i started to challenge other stuff so i started watching you paula gia uh doug pine creek um Aaron Aaron ra um uh, matt dillahunty i started watching in fact matt dillahunty i remember years ago when he debated jordan peterson and that was back when jordan peterson was my guy because you got to imagine i'm like a that's he's like perfect for me he talks about psychedelics he loves the bible perfect guy for me right and right so i'm in recovery so this is all jordan peterson was like the prophet for me right right and i'm watching him debate matt dillahunty and i remember thinking dude dillahunty's fucking him up i'm sorry for the language he's he is destroyed his logic was just crushing him and i mm -hmm. remember being like what why isn't jordan peterson like 
why isn't he like like it you can tell he was not i, I don't know i don't want to say winning but like Jordan Peterson was just saying stupid stuff, and Matt Dillahunty was just like blocking it down with just like, for example, Jordan Peterson was like, or Matt Dillahunty was like, how can you how can you demonstrate that God exists? And Jordan Peterson said, because psychedelics. Yeah, he went straight into the uh, the evidence is the psychedelics. Yeah, and I'm like, wait a minute, but that was <laughs> this was before this is while well, this is way before that might have planted a seed. I'm thinking about that now because like I, these are all little chips that kept hitting the wall right 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 but you know what i'm saying like so yeah the internet is what the internet's doing its thing like the truth comes out with, with the internet so okay you got to you you're jordan peterson debating matt delahunty so that tells you that gives you a timeline before that you you, you mentioned to me you and me have a common path here as i de- deconstructed i got into manly p hall i got into esotericist and oh, yeah. i started to look at astrotheology and things did you skip that and no, no, into- that was the next chapter. So after okay. I left, after I figured out Christianity was bunk, I still believed in something. Right. So right. I went to Gnosticism. I said the Gnostics were the ones that had the truth because they pointed, because I, I started, to, now I'm starting to question the Bible. I'm like, yeah, you know what? Why did Adam and Eve sin? Why? God probably made, I started going down that path. Like mm-hmm. he knew this. Oh, he's the evil one. And then I, because I, I was like, okay, the Gnostics were right. The demiurge is evil. The creator is evil. We got to get it. We got to, we have to escape this world now. And I'll get into Gnosticism. I got into, and then you're Manly P. Hall, Manly P. Hall. Um, some of those, you know, like the, the, those like, ty- um, what's his name? Carl Young. Cause I read like the red right. book, Carl Young, all that stuff. Got big into Gnosticism. And uh, that didn't really last long. It was just something to like go down the ladder. Right. Like, like you're landing the airplane. That 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 you know is going down, right? Once you get into the the mindset where you want truth and you don't care about you don't care about being on a team anymore. Once you're once you're once you're for team whatever the truth is, that's just a that's just a, a matter of time before you end up going to naturalism, human like uh you know for, like naturalism like that's right. that's the, that's the true that's the only thing that we can actually say for certain that this is what it is like there's no everything else is just like you have to you have to sort of make leaps in logic for it to be true right 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 and then whether it is true or not that's 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 the problem right is making the leap so we we've we've went from having to have confidence and a certainty in our mind of comfort right you felt special in that prison cell you you were promised something that whether it was true or not, you needed that at that moment. So psychologically, it gratified. It was it was good that you had that moment, which is why a lot of people think religion is the opium of the masses. It's the idea that it's necessary and good for all the common folk who can't. There's some people who actually say this. It's for common. It's for everybody. Like the typical, um, you want religion to kind of control the masses and things like that. You want everybody to start thinking outside the box. Some people have made this statement. Um, However, you went from that to leaving this and realizing, did you need that in order to feel special, to feel like you're part of something? Or how did that psychologically work for you? Because I can, I could give you my, my skit, if that makes sense. I started to internalize. I became like you, an esotericist. I started looking at well, that doesn't, maybe that doesn't mean what I thought it meant. And maybe there are other understandings of the Bible that really the bubble fundamentalists don't get. And, you know, I didn't, ex- I didn't exhaustively look through everything there was to look for, but I started to find comfort in realizing there's wisdom in other traditions outside of Christianity, outside of the Bible. I saw Buddhism. I saw parables that were stuff it, blowing my mind and going, that's, that's practically true, like in terms of practicality. So I found truth, if you will, in, in, in lessons of human wisdom, etc., in various religions. So I get outside of that bubble of fundamentalism, but I held on to a higher power. And then one day I'm listening to this parable, a couple different parables, and I started to look inside myself. I started to look and go, what if God is me? What if I am the divine, right? Like, like, what if it's really me that's the creator? The God is actually made in the image of us. 
And when I started asking those questions, that's when couple that with, with science, right? You start looking at using certain tools that help you ground in some reality that we can actually test and observe, et cetera. Then I started realizing it was me all along that carried myself when I was in drug addiction. Right. It was me that had the strength. And uh, I don't know, I built that relationship with myself. What about you? Yeah, no, and, and I, it's, it's like finding a purpose, right? Like the church gives you a purpose. It gives you something to look forward to, something to be like to hang your hat on. But that replaced, I replaced that with honesty, like being an honest person, being just not trying to fit square pegs into round holes anymore. Just being following the truth became that replaced it. Right. And it's actually, there's actually something more profound in that when you let go of everything and you don't care about being right and you just focus on what the truth is or what makes sense and what is logical, there's something more profound in that than there is in, Oh, if I die, I'm going to go to heaven and everyone else is going to go to hell. It's it's, it just is. You don't so you I found another psychological attachment to ambiguity. In fact, not knowing there's a comfort finally without having to be certain about anything and, and finding that, uh, that, comfort there for me it was like always being dogmatic always having to know always having to prove that i'm right, right. defending my truth starting with it's true though and then defending it and not knowing that it's true and, and and that's what i see over and over in these religious conversations but now that i'm starting with that i'm not sure and i'm only going to go off of what i can test and what i can actually know rather than assuming things and being a tribalistic type of person who's assuming stuff you know what i mean and it's like the Bruce Lee quote, like, just be like water. Just go with, go with the flow. Like the, don't try to go against the grain. Like the, it is what it is. Like we're here. We're, we don't know that like what's going to happen. Like who knows? Like we don't know where we at, what this universe is. We haven't figured it all out yet. You know what I'm saying? Right. There's a lot of questions and it's okay to say you don't know. Yeah. When, yeah. The, when, when you hear those fundamentals say, well, you don't know what happens after we die. You don't know what happened before the big bang. You're right. I don't, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 Neither do they. <laughs> right. right, right. All right. Let me get these super chats here going up to the tippy. And um, and we will obviously take questions along the way. Thank you to everybody who's liked the video so far and commented. It helps the algo keep growing. Uh, Gaius, are you a mythicist and why or why not? I actually forgot to mention when I when I finally got out of Christianity, like when I was I guess when I was in the Gnostic phase, maybe even still a little bit after that too, I was. Because when you when you actually go into the evidence for Christianity, I'm not I'm, right now I'm not a mythicist. Right now I think there was there, there is a sort of it wouldn't matter to me, but yeah, either way. But go when ahead. you when you go from the fundamentalist, everything is real, this whole thing's true, to finding out that there's no physical evidence for Jesus, there's, there's no physical evidence for the apostles, there's no eyewitnesses, it's all secondary paul saying it's all when you find that out it's almost like normal to react into a myth this is yes 100 comfortable actually to go we have been duped um we just don't have the like nobody's telling us the facts as they really are and because of that it's easy to think and it doesn't mean mythicism is wrong either okay I'm, I'm making a point to to try and back up what we're trying to say here it's so easy to see why the Jesus we're told about, the one we're reading in the New Testament, didn't exist. I'm a historicist. I think there was a guy. But the guy we're reading about in the Gospels did not exist. Yeah. So even as a non-mythicist, right? So to get direct to the question, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll literally won't spend too much time on this, but why or why not? Um, I'm not dogmatic on this question. I really am not. I can't tell you. Like, I'm not going to stand here and be like, yes, I'm going to go debate someone and tell them how he is existent. No. There's a few things to me that make more sense on the historicist side. And if you dwell and focus on other material and ignore the things I'm saying, or you try to, you can try and fit all of this stuff to package into a mythicist model, um, then sure, you can dwell on that and hold your idea if you're like, I'm. I'll be damned. Mythicism has to be true in your head. Maybe you have to hold on to that. Maybe there's a psychological reason why you must be mythicist. I don't know. For me, I was, I was total Jesus is God to, he didn't exist. 
probably and most likely didn't exist and that he might have been a solar god or some symbol of the sun, moon, and stars, astrotheology, then finally got into more scholarship versions of mythicism. And for me, it's the idea that he was born of a woman, the seed of David, the idea he was crucified. I don't take that as just generic. I think I think everything we see within the New Testament and Paul's time, as well as with the Gospels, yes, I know the Gospels are very fictional in many ways, but you see Josephus, uh, Luke's using Josephus. They're talking about crucifixion of Jews. Romans are doing this. I don't take the archons of this age to be only demons and spirits. I think that Paul believes these demon spirits, whatever you want to call them, archons, daemons, are controlling humans. So they're active in the world, and they're controlling the actions of Romans and Jews that are rejecting Christ. They're blinded by Christ. So I don't take it as only spiritual beings and, and crucifixions only heavenly. Uh, Elaine Pagels talks about this in The Origins of Satan, her book, where it's both and. It's not either or. Once you see that, you can imagine a spiritual world for Paul that is based in the reality he's experiencing in the world around him. He's Yes, he's extremely superstitious, but he also is looking around him going, those Romans are controlled by demons. They are controlled by the powers of this age. And this is the way I understand it to make the most sense. So I think there was a, a cultic leader to start this thing out. And then from there, uh, the mythologizing take place. He was probably charismatic. Reminds me of Jim Jones when he talks about you should love or hate your father, mother, sister, brother. Come follow me. If you're not willing to do that, then you're not one of us. You're not in the kingdom. And you practically love the world rather than, than Christ. It, this idea sounds like Jim Jones. Uh, you know, you can paint Jesus, I guess, however you want, but it sounds very apocalyptic. And if I look at apocalypticism and I look at the Qumran sect and I look at all the other Jewish literature, I don't think they are completely mythologized. I think that there's a guy at the basis, the teacher of righteousness we see in the Dead yeah. Sea Scrolls, et cetera. And, and I mean, literally the, it goes on and 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 on. You can disagree with me to the cow's fly. That's fine. I don't mind, but there's my reasoning. What about you? No, yeah, and th to me, it's simple. It's the Nazareth thing, and I and I don't know all the mythicists when you say this because he's all right. The Messiah is supposed to be from Bethlehem. He's supposed to be like David, right? He's supposed to be a repeat of David, and it's in the text he's born in Bethlehem. Now he's from Nazareth, right? So why would they do that? This doesn't make any sense. Um, but mythicists will say, but it says in the text, let's this the scripture says it come from Nazareth. Well, to me, it sounds more like they're putting that there to make sense of why he's from Nazareth. Now, and now they're going to say, well, they don't have all the scripture. Enoch was quoted. We don't have the Enoch. Well, sure. But until we find some scripture that says he's going to be from Nazareth, you can't just, you can't just make that up. You have to, we have to find, if you find that, then yeah, I'll go with that. But to me, it's the Nazareth thing. Really. It's that's, I, you know, we could, we could literally play devil's advocate and go back and forth. In right. fact, we could literally argue for mythicism. I know oh, the yeah, Philippians no. hymn, that's an early Pauline idea, Philippians hymn. The way mythicists understand that hymn is that Jesus was preexistent. He's in a heavenly being. He comes down into the lower heavens, et cetera. But I've also, the thing is, is not just reading mythicist material. Like consider reading, um, you know, Dr. James D. Tabor on the Philippians hymn. He points out that this Philippians hymn was applied to a man that was apl applied to a man who is then a son of God due to his resurrection. So before Jesus' resurrection, he wasn't son of God, Romans 1.4. He was a man who gets deified in a sense. And this is very complex to get into because this gets into deification from, from not normal humans into a deified status. That's a weird Roman era idea that Paul seems to be uh, aware of. There's a lot to this. And so I've been looking at all these different sides. I don't close my mind off to them. I get why each side thinks the way they do. I want both sides to be a little less dogmatic. And I'm talking well, within skeptical circles. I wish there was less dogmatic, dogmatic stuff going on. Well, I will say this, though. You hear in the scholarly circles all the time. They're not, they don't, we don't take this. This is like the cheese, the moon being cheese, right? Like, to me, that's ridiculous because... Think about this. If Jesus was a myth, nothing, nothing changes. Like this, mm -hmm. the world goes on this, like, for example, all the, all the characters in the new Testament, the, all the, the, the apostles, Mary, where are their descendants? Where are their mm -hmm. kids? Where are their uncle? 
they're, they, they're, that's it. They're in the, they're in the new Testament and they're nowhere else. Right. And, and so like you take anyone else from history and, and like you'll hear Gary Habermas compare him to Alexander the great or Julius Caesar, all those people, you know, where they're, you know, who their children were, who their air, who the air was, who their like you could you could trace their bloodlines down generations. You know where their family, you know where they lived, you know where they were. Even other writers like Philo and and Josephus, you know who Josephus tells you who his kids are. We know who they married into, which family. Philo marries marries into the Agrippa bloodline. He's you see he's got a a, a niece named Ber, Veronica or Bernice, however you want to say it. But like we could trace these people's families and where they are with people in the Gospels. You don't get any of that. Mm-hmm. They're just they. It's like they if they if they disappear, nothing changes. Right. It doesn't do anything. And people still go on believing. (laughs) Right. People are still going to believe in this no matter what. It's it's you went from the fundamentalist to now where you're at and you're turning on a different light switch rather than believing and trying to prove that you that this is true. You're starting with I'm cautious. I'm skeptical. And you're using different tools. You're using different tools than you once used to approach or ascertain what you can know instead of assuming. Right. Like you and me, we can go read uh, uh, Livy, right? I was uh, Livy, if you will. Right. I was I was reading this the other day as I'm writing an article right now for Bart Ehrman's blog, and um, hopefully he passes it and it'll be published. But um, you know, I quoted Livy where he talks about Romulus coming down and, of course, appearing to Julius. I can't remember the guy's name, but he appears to him. We could read that and believe it. Is there any actual data to really believe what the account is saying? Or do you have to build this string of evidence to assume, well, the martyrdoms are true. And like, you got this load of mythologizing of martyrdoms. That's not true. Right. And you go, why should I believe your apologetic spin on this to try and like assume? And then I have contemporary evidence to say, well, you know, Muslims are blowing themselves up in the airplane in nine 11. They believed in their truth. Is that true? They're willing to die. Right. Now, then, you know. And then James dies. He dies one way in the Josephus history. He dies another way in the, in the, in the, uh, what's his name? Uh, Eusebius's history. Right. So which, which, which one is it? Did it, how did he die? If he's dying two different ways in two different histories, why should I believe these other ones? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't yeah. know. You were able to start questioning things you never would have before. And that is the thing. And I think people go, well, you're, you've gone too far. Why aren't you questioning everything? You're not. And, and I think it's because we came out of a strict fundamentalism. Jake E. Paik, thank you so much for the super chat, my friend. Derek, Myth Vision, do you know the Myth Visions of Western Georgia? Eleanor Myth Vision started a homestead there after World War I, recently adopted son Tyrone Myth Vision, played on the West Georgia basketball team. Is that real? <laughs> Hold on. What is this? Let me see something. Is this, is this a joke, Jake? I can't imagine someone's last name is actually named Myth Vision. I'll be shocked. Let me see something here. Uh, yeah, I think they're just trolling you right now. <laughs> I know, right? I'm wondering if that's Eleanor. Yeah, Eleanor Myth Vision to World War One. <laughs> Myth Vision can't be, bro. <laughs> I'm like, when I went to make this name of the of the channel, I was like search, searching hard and I was thinking hard, like, all right, how would this work? You know what I mean? You, you, you see, uh, this is, is you joking, joking me, He's Jake? Joking. Are you joking me, man? He's joking. Okay. He's teasing me. Thanks for that super chat, my friend. I appreciate it. <laughs> Seriously, appreciate that. Okay. Um, you're questioning everything now, or at least you're approaching it in a way of like, maybe I'm wrong. I got to start from scratch. I have to unlearn. That's the hard part. Unlearning and then approaching to learn. Behind you is a bookshelf loaded with literature. I mean, you name it. You're sending me like... <laughs> You're sending me screenshots and you're posting them on Facebook of the craziest stuff that I'm like, oh my gosh, they publicly wrote things like this. Right, right, right. Um, What is up with that fascination? Did you always have that kind of fascination and did you always read that kind of material while you were still a Christian or were you kind of ignoring it for a while and then? Yeah, no, I, de- I didn't get, get this deep into, into history until I started questioning Christianity. Uh, once I started to like read like Josephus and Herodotus and like, this is some fascinating stuff right here. Like history is wild. True history is what more wild than biblical history. Sometimes 
Like it's just just the way the world unfolded throughout the centuries is just like this. I don't know. It's just fat, I'm just captivated by it now. So that's not going to change anytime soon. You know, like Thucydides and Herodotus, the way they wrote histories. Um, Robin Faith Walsh, you know, was on recently, and she's coming on again soon to talk about this live. But it, the way that they wrote history isn't like what we would write a history book as, where we're going to give you just data and facts about what happened. They're mythologizing stuff. They're writing of accounts. People, it's like that uh, telephone game too. Like you tell someone this, and then by the time it gets there, it's changed and embellished. But I can't remember who it was. Maybe you can help me where they set, they made up a story is second, third century AD. They made up a story. They went around telling that the man went up from the pyre and a phoenix came down and like swooped him up and whatnot. And the very next day, he said, an old man was telling it as if he was an eyewitness of the account when the historian, the author of this history, literally said, like, I made this up and told this story and people started believing it. Now there's an old man 24 hours later running around saying, I saw the Phoenix come down and get him, sir. And he's telling me my own lie, telling me that he was a witness of it. Yeah. So people are full of it. Right. Why aren't we starting with people are full of it? Well, I mean, that's like one out of a million Julius Caesar when he dies. Uh, um, What's his name? Ovid. Ovid's Metamorphosis. He says that Venus, the goddess, came down and picked him up from the funeral pyre, brought him up to heaven, gave him a throne, and that his adoption to Augustus makes, makes him the son of God. And then he he um, you know, he basically lives through Caesar now. And he all the conspirators, like Brutus and all those guys, Cicero, they're all dead within a year. So he avenges his father from the grave and he is, and he, he ushers in the Pax Romana. Alexander the Great, he goes to Egypt and liberates the Egyptians from the Persians. He goes out to the desert. And in halfway through the desert, they run out of water. This is what the historians write. He runs out of water. They're all going to die. Rain magically comes from the sky and saves everybody. So he has enough time to get to, get to the Oracle of Amon. When he gets to the Oracle of Amon, he wants to know about his father's Philip, Philip uh, Macedon, if he, how he got killed. And who, if the person who killed him got, got killed too. And, and what does Amon say to him? Your father is alive. I, and he says, I, your father is me. You are the son of, like, he's the God, Amon. And he's basically yeah. Zeus too. So he's like the, the head honcho God. So this is like, he's becoming the son of God. This is like a trope that is all over the ancient world. Right. And to imagine that the New Testament authors are untainted by this is unbelievable. And this is, this is one of the reasons, even Paul. So when I said, why don't we start with people are full of it, right? I think we should apply that to any and all literature, right? When we get into it and then work your way from there to seeing, does this guy really believe what he's saying and, and draw your own conclusions? But starting with this is true because they believed it was true. Do you know how many people believe that, uh, you know, there were healings happening every time you turn around and the Greco Roman deities were a part of this As Asclepius, especially, I mean, I mean like every corner Asclepius is healing and they had, you know, a guy, one of the things that Bob price told me that was just blown my mind is they had testimonies like, like, a like you have blurbs on your, you know, on a book I'm reading James table right here before we get started on Thursday M. David Litwa and James are coming on to talk about deification yeah. and Paul's ascent to paradise. What is going on here? Oh, this is going to be so good, bro. Um, I don't want to lose track, but I was just going to simply say um, what I was getting at is Bob tells about the guy with no eyeballs. He yeah. was born without eyeballs in his socket. This isn't, this is a better miracle. I think than any new Testament miracle, no balls in his socket. And he walks into the temple of Asclepius, sleeps overnight, comes out. He's got eyeball sockets, like eyeballs in his sockets. That's what the. Well, Vespasian, two accounts, Tacitus. No, no. no is it Suetonius and Tacitus? I think it is. Both of them say that he went to, he had a healing in Samar Samaria at the, at the um, Oracle of the Samaritan God or something like that. Right. And then he goes to Egypt. Serapis. 
he one. says somebody's leg grew back. Somebody's he he spit on somebody's eyes, and they and then uh, Su- I think it's Suetonius who says, "I have no reason to lie." Like this is a secular historian telling these stories. This is not a it's not a gospel of Vespasian. So yes, yeah. <laughs> crazy, right? Yeah, I mean, I think this is uh, something that happened a lot, and I, I've been asking the question about magic in the ancient world because I wanted to know like. <sighs> what it meant to be a miracle worker type. What were they actually doing? What kind of, I guess you could use the term con type stuff is going on out there. Are they, are they actually growing their legs or they're doing the shoe trick? I mean, like the sandal trick, who knows? I mean, what, what, what kind of things are going on there? And the reason is I stopped thinking Christianity was the truth. And it's because I saw it everywhere, all of these world religions. So I had to, I, my God at the moment in my deconversion went from Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one can get to the Father except through him. Limited, only this, to why is all of these miracle accounts, all of these common tropes and themes, patterns is what I started catching all throughout the world. You know, early Justin Martyr and others, they had uh, something they were trying to say, you know. Look, uh, this is patterned off of those things uh, and just like those, but this is the true one. Almost like C.S. Lewis talks about the true myth is Christianity. All the other myths aren't true. How do you know that? Like Justin Martyr says it's the demons that cause all those other myths to to sound like Christianity. Mm. He put that Justin Martyr. I thought he said, I thought he was the one that maybe he is the one that said, no, he's the one that said that the reason why all these other myths sound like Christianity is because the demons knew about this. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's started becoming silly to me. That whole, uh, that was what, as a Christian, I'm saying, of course it does to us today, but as a Christian, that was like, that sounds like an excuse. Well, it's only and, it's the second century. That's off the bat. There are people are already starting to, that tells you that people are already criticizing this Christian movement as early as the second century. Why else would he write that? Yeah. He's responding to people who are probably raising that very point. Like, Hey dude, you, you, your dude looks like Dionysus. Like, Hey dude, your dude actually looks like a Sclepius. Why do you have him healing everybody doing this, this stuff? You're copying us or something. Maybe they're maybe they're raising these problems and Justin Martyr engaging in the pagan world uh, is is responding to that. So these are problems. Why is it so similar? <laughs> Why are there very there are differences too? Don't get me wrong. Nobody's pretending there aren't, but that's the that's that straw man like you think they're identical and, and they want to only raise the differences rather than the similarities. I say, look at both. Don't only try to, because the mission I think that Christians think we're on is only trying to find differences and, or, or sorry, similarities and commons and, and then that's it. And I think that maybe sometimes that's the focus and it becomes parallelomania because there's so much trying to make it different from the rest of the world that it was in as if, no, the, the pagan world had no touching on Christianity. There was no influence from outside sources. This, this, that. No, no, no. Only the Hebrew Bible is what we're mimetically connecting to, et cetera, et cetera. As if that's how it really works in the real world. No, no, no. That's ridiculous. Uh, it, that, that That's harder to believe. You know how that, what is it, Frank Turek? I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I don't have enough faith to think that ridiculous. Okay, like that's how stupid I think that idea would be to imagine that this this Christian movement lived in a vacuum in the first century, second century, and there was no outside influence at all. It's just silly. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going on a rant. No, it's, it's the truth. Was, I, there, I, I, was there another super chat? No, 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 nobody. Oh, okay. Feel free to super chat your questions. If you guys have any questions or any comments or if you just support well, you whatever. Know- you know what I think we should bring up? We got a trip coming up in a couple months. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Israel. You and I are going to Israel. We will be there recording with Dr. Tabor. And, man, I love his writing style, bro. I just started reading this book this morning. This was yeah. this is his book, Paul Paul's Ascent to Paradise. And, um, like, yeah, it, the Jesus Dynasty is great, too. I Yeah, Paul and Jesus was great. His yeah. book, Paul and Jesus, was amazing. He talks, uh, Paul is strange, bro. Paul is not what orthodoxies painted him. I'm telling you, he is radically different. This guy has a new family of God idea. This guy is like. Well, you know what he is? He's a marketing genius. 
Paul looked at Christianity and said, I can market this to the Greeks, to the people in Phrygia and, and Cappadocia who are worshiping Artemis. I, I know what they want. They don't want the circumcision. They don't want the, the temp. They don't want the, uh, you know, the, you know, all that law stuff. They want somebody that's going to assure them paradise just for believing. And then there'll be, a, you know what I'm saying? Like he knows what to do. So he markets Christianity in a way, brings it over to Turkey, modern day Turkey, Greece, all of those areas, Macedonia, Thessalonica, and he sells it and it works. That's why, I, that's what Paul, that's why Paul, that's is, your conclusion on Paul. That's my, that's my personal. Fee- okay. 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 Let me throw you mine. I do not rule out what you said, but I'll go a step further. I think Paul believes in what he's doing. Oh, so yeah. while he, I, I, I got to add that caveat because we can psychoanalyze from 2000 years removed. We don't really know. Uh, was it only for money? Was it only for power? These ideas. We have someone I think is a, a good example. We have data on, and that is Joseph Smith. And I've asked this question, was Joseph Smith a con man? And when we, when I talk to the historians, they say yes and no. Yes, he was. There were some things he lied about. There's some things he did, but the guy was nutty enough to actually believe in the things that he was actually doing and saying. So there's this both and. And if you go back in the first century, it is superstition heaven. I mean, like if you're superstitious, step on a crack, break your mama's back, you'd have fit right into the first century and everything was probably somehow superstitious and connected to a demon or an angel or spirits, women wearing head coverings, as Dr. Price points out in other academics, they wore head coverings, not because it was like, uh, out of just respect for my husband, it's much deeper. They thought the angels would come down and have sex with your women. This is a world that you just can't imagine. Like it's that superstitious that they wore head coverings to protect from angels from angels coming down like Genesis six and may, and having children with them. And it, it wasn't uncommon in the Greco Roman world because Zeus came down would rape a woman and have children or yeah. even rape a little boy, et cetera. Like there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on. It was a world like Skyrim or Witcher. <laughs> it was just like a world of just like crazy. Everyone yeah. believes in superstition everywhere. Yeah. They didn't have, they didn't figure like, you can go back far enough. This is before this time, but they thought when the rain came, this was the gods giving us rain. They didn't know what, what precipitation is and all evaporation. They didn't know any of that stuff. They didn't know where anything was coming. How, why are the plants growing? I don't know. It must be a God. Like, and then that's where the, the God of the gaps comes from, because that's how you get to deism in the, in the enlightenment era, because we're figuring stuff out now. And where's God now? He's got to be some, well, he's beyond space and time. I think it goes down to the the philosophers. Yeah. See, the advancements, I think, happen in philosophy. I, typically, that's when you start seeing advancements that start to finally... I, I'm reading a book that's... It's a big yellow book, and it's like all about the history of philosophy as far back as we can go from quotes from, you name it, Confucius to Buddha to you know the Greco-Roman worlds, etc., and showing how eventually we start getting down to like, uh, I think, therefore I am, and getting into right. how philosophy starts to couple into science, and then where we are today. But it was these superstitions that are like little windows of fossils in time. You could see how humans thought. That's yeah. why I love this stuff. Well, yeah, because you get you get the Epicureans right, and they're they're early naturalists. They believe that this you this reality is not what Plato says Plato's wrong because Plato believes in metaphysics, heaven, hell forms, right? True forms. Yeah. The Epicureans are the Stoics. They're like, yeah, everything's atoms and voids. And, uh, you know, that's there. They have a different word. It turns out they're, they were more right, but they weren't right about, it. they had some weird views too. They, right. they weren't, they didn't have it spot on. They had some weird, some of them believed in reincarnation. Some of them are Neo-Pythagoreans. Anyways, it turned, but those two, those two streams of philosophy sort of, go in a certain direction and then those branch out into other things. And, but you can see over time that the, 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 uh, the, the Stoics were more, the Epicureans were, they had a better idea of reality than the Platonists did. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, no, I get it. And that's one of those, uh, Richard Carrier's book, uh, yeah, goes yeah. into the science of the ancient world. He, he deals with yeah. how the philosophy and science. That's where I learned. That's why I'm, he's one of the ones I'm reading that 
I learned this stuff from. It's you. on Audible if you want to read it. Clara, Elisa, Alyssa, thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate that. And Jake E. Paik, thank you again, my friend. Has your skepticism in any way been shaped by the work of UNC professor Dr. Barterman? I think it means Dr. Barterman. Uh, but it's Dr. Barterman. <laughs> um uh, yeah actually that's a good question the um the king james only it um this is a really good question because bart airman one of his videos is one of the reasons why i figured out the king james bible wasn't pure and perfect there's a video literally is about the king james bible it's bart airman destroying the not uh, not on purpose but like from my point of view like he is like oh by the way first john 5 7 that's a 14th century edition in latin there's no greek manuscript that exists in that i'm like there's no way this can be true i gotta look into this oh shit he's right and like 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 bar airman was huge in that in that aspect when right. it comes to textual criticism yeah he I, I i think forged was the first book that when i listened i just was in love i, I was like this is really really interesting how the ancients wrote and how they would forge letters in other people's names etc which is another kind of conspiracy that raises more doubt and makes you question and makes you want to go, hold on. That's why a lot of mythicists love Bart for many, many reasons, right? He gives more reason to doubt, more skepticism. Um, but I think, I think how Jesus became God to me was a little more dense in terms of the development idea of the Christology of Jesus early in Paul, Mark, and then working its way out. And he does a beautiful job of showing that. Like when we did when we did our recent recordings, you, me, and Bart, and I, you know, because I host those things now to help Bart make it easy. Uh, Mike Jones was interviewing um, Mike Lacona, right? And he was like, "So, Mike, these skeptics, you know, inspiring philosophy for those who don't know the big uh, apologist YouTube channel, my friend Michael Jones. For those skeptics who think that uh, Jesus is not equated with God, Yahweh." Um, we're going to get into Mark and him and Mike Lacona were really going into Mark. And so I had to jab back recently with Bart and I said, you know, they're saying that Jesus is Yahweh and he's equal to Yahweh and Mark and he's Yahweh. And he's like, I don't know, you know, Bart's face and he'll have those wild laughs, the dad laughs, you know, he laughs at his own jokes type of guy. And, uh, and he's just like, I don't know where these Christians are getting these ideas from. No, he is not. God is giving him authority he is not god he god is giving him his authority on earth that's the whole point i mean it he just literally, he literally says i only hear to do the will of the father the father like he's talking he's every time he speaks he's separating himself he's like giving yeah. that image there's a separation between him you know what i'm saying and then he, right. there's even parts where they're like how do i get to heaven oh uh you know believe but uh, believe, uh pray to god or you know he says like He's talking about something else. And by the way, the text could just come out and say it whenever it wants to. It never does. It could just say, <laughs> Jesus is Yahweh. Never does that. I'm I'm equal and there's a triune God. Well, you know, actually, 1 John does say that, but that comes way later. I think it is. Isn't it 1 John? Or is it? Yeah. In Let's, the the word uh, with God, right? Is that what you're talking I'm about? I'm talking about the three who is in heaven. Uh, the, the, that's, the, that's the 14th century. That's the one I was That's what I'm about. saying. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's they not, were... Wasn't it Erasmus who was saying like, hey, I, I'm, I can't add this into this translation. I don't find any Greek manuscripts early on that have this. If you were able to find one, right. then we can add it in there. And oh, wouldn't you know, within 24 hours, they had it and they added it in there to make sure that it's in the New Testament, man. That's, that's uh, It happens to be the only verse that says a, that the, it, it alludes to a trinity. It just happens to be that one. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's so interesting. Jake, thanks for the uh, super chat, my friend. One, one more thing on that. Bart yeah. Aaron's book, Lost Christianities, was huge for me because I was like, I never realized the early Christians are more diverse than a Catholic and a Mormon is today. Let me repeat that. <laughs> a Mormon and a Catholic today, you we all think they're miles apart, right? They had different right, right, books. Right. They believe in different prophets and all that stuff. They have multiple deities. Some of these Gnostics. That's what I'm saying. Mormons and Mormons and Catholics all agree that Jesus is God. The early Christians, they didn't believe. They didn't all agree on that. Some, Some believed he was just a man. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that book was huge for me, too. 
Mm, you're hitting the nail on the head there. There's so much. And the found Christianities by David Litt was actually a direct response to lost Christianities by Bart Ehrman. Man, I'm excited. I love this stuff. This is what I do, man. I love this stuff. And I appreciate everybody in the, the chat who's into this as well. Because once you know it, it makes it like more fun. It's another, it's another way to explore and get into this and realize like, whoa, this thing had its claws on me. I, but I didn't know Jack. And I know how much I don't know now, but it, there's so much to learn about it that makes it exciting. Like, man, we haven't been told the whole truth. That's for sure. Spartan theology, my friend, a good Christian buddy of mine. Thank you so much for the super chat. And um, yeah, we should definitely catch up sometime too as well. When I do a live hangout, you come hang out with us. If you can get the child watched. I know how it is with newborns and young babies. Who's your favorite Christian Paul scholar? Mine, don't get upset if you're watching this. If you're if you're if you're a scholar of mine and, and you've come on the channel, don't get upset. But I'll tell you why. Christopher Stanley. I did the video yesterday. The video I launched yesterday was Christopher Stanley. He is a Christian. He is a Christian. But he is all about what is actually going on in the history, the cultural, the the reality on the ground with Paul. He's looking at the data. Of course, he's all over the Greek. He has completely pioneered new concepts in Pauline scholarship. He doesn't get into the Paul within Judaism school, th these debates that are more theological, as much as he is, what is the reality on the ground with Paul? And he has gone on record telling me, even though he's a Christian, he says, I wouldn't go to my church and say this, but Paul definitely does not believe in that you know Jesus is Yahweh or equal to Yahweh and that he's God, like this, this triune idea. He's not that. Paul does not believe that. And that's coming from a Christian who I think does believe that. And he separates his faith from his scholarship in a way that I have not seen many Christians be able to do. That's why I appreciate him. And uh, anyway, do you have a Christian scholar that's a Paul? Absolutely. Off the, this is not, I don't even think about this. It's Dale C. Ellison. I just had an interview with him about a week ago, and I had so much fun. It was the hour flew right back. He was he's great. He's he's he is just completely honest. It's you know how hard you know how hard that's got to like when I was a Christian I couldn't do that. <laughs> he can he can do it. He's like oh yeah. By, by the way, these uh the Gospels they um they contradict each other completely. Like Luke saying something different than Mark and Paul saying different something from James. They yeah. do not agree. But he has a personal belief, and that's what you can. How can you knock him for that? You know what I mean. People have their own beliefs. I like I like Dell a lot. Um, as far as like the question, just making it Paul, a uh, specific Paul, and like limiting it to that, I have to say it was Christopher Stanley for that. Uh, but also, you know, you're right about Dell. I really enjoy him. And the thing is, like when I was at his house, when we weren't recording in between each session, we'd have conversation to come up with the next topic that I want to discuss. I would tell him why I disagreed with some of his conclusions in his resurrection book. And he goes, well, you, you could be right. You could be in the, but I, you know, it might be my bias. And he's like, maybe I like this idea. And that's why I went with this. And I'm like, I can't argue with that. I mean, you're not dogmatic. You just tell us why you think the way you do. And I wish more academics were like that, that were, that were of the faith uh, position. I try to give him a steel man softball, right? I was like, you know, this is the end of the interview. I'm just wanting to get, I'm trying to like wrap it up. And I'm like, do you think that the fact that Christianity went from being just like a small little sect into taking over the Roman Empire, do you think, do you see that as evidence of the truth of it? And he's like, no. I'm like, wow, I like this guy. Because yeah. most, most Christians will say, just look at the outcome. Right. The Romans were, were, were persecuting them and the Romans became Christians. Therefore, Christ they'll, that's their big, they love that argument. Yep. But it's like, then you gotta, then it's like, why did they win off? Why did they lose all four crusades? It's like, you can't just pick one little time in history and not like where, you know what I mean? So Dale was real with that. He was like, no, that's not, that doesn't mean anything. He's like, he's like, bad ideas went out all the time. He's like, I, that's nothing. I'm, I'm, that was a good answer. I thought, you know. I think so, too. I mean, that same argument can be used for some of the other world religions that yeah. we look at that have consumed, you know, many regions of the world. Uh, even the conquest and development of Islam, like the growth and its speed and its rate of conquering, etc. 
you know, just because and there's different philosophies involved. Of course, one is really driven by the sword, but at least initially, you know, there's this idea of conquest to, to take over. Um, but there's, there's a lot of reasons to doubt that. And I respect Dell for that. So I hope that answered your question, Spartan. And thank you for the support. Doc Pleromonot, Romans 9, 5, Paul certainly thought Jesus was God in a certain sense, but not the Father. Agreed. Mix of high pre-incarnate, then post-crucifixion exalted Christology. Mix of high pre-incarnate, then post-crucifixion exalted Christology. I, I think that's perfectly said. I agree. What do you think? Um... High pre-incarnate. Uh, yeah, I think Paul, so, had, weirdly enough, I think he believes, I think he's lining more up with John than the other Gospels. On this idea, right. Like John has the pre-existing logos, and everyone thinks that's like a progression over time. But I think you can say Paul started out with that. Paul, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, this is the tough thing, because Romans 1-4 has him become a son of God. Like, at his resurrection, because he rose from the dead, God granted him, like the fathers making him a son of God. So at his resurrection, he becomes a son of God. In Mark, Jesus becomes a son of God at his baptism. Right. And in Matthew, he's born a son of God. In Luke, he's born a son of God. In John, he's always been the Logos, and he's the son of God since before the foundation of the world, it seems. And if John is in the Johannine tradition as potentially revelation may or may not be, revelation seems, I don't know how you want to interpret this, but he was predestined or he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. I wonder if this idea is this preexistent concept. I don't know. I threw that out there one time and, and some people thought maybe that's, maybe that's true. We don't know how that's supposed to be understood, but yeah, I have, I, I would read James Tabor's uh, Philippians hymn explanation on this uh, because I know that a lot of mythicists also use the Philippians hymn to show like, listen, he was already existing. He was in heaven. He came down to a lower part in heaven. And this is evidence that he never actually was a guy on earth. Um, there are other people who have different views. I would say look into that. But Doc, you always come through. I just want to give a shout out, man. You always come through with some questions that like 90% of them are even over my head. I'm like, you know, this guy's really uh, a sharp cookie. I'm going to tell you, he's, he's sharp. Always like what half the words I can't pronounce. What's going on here? Ted Francis' favorite uh, Bible book. What's your favorite Bible book? Oh, good question. Um, uh, you know, uh, Genesis. I honestly, Genesis it just it's just the weirdest. <laughs> it's the weirdest. Like, just it has it all. Like, it has the the you know the creation of the world all the way down to Moses. It's got. It's just. I just that's why I don't know. It's, that's the first. That's the one. Dude, that's so weird. I actually was thinking Genesis too. It's, it's good. Man. I was thinking Genesis as well. Have you yeah. ever read have you ever read Jasher or Jubilees? The other like yes, the yes, oh, yeah, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't really care for the beginning of Jubilees. I mean, it just is like everything's calendar. It, it it like it's inundated with nonstop, but it it takes like a different approach to the creation. That I just was like kind of bored at the intro of Jubilees, to be honest with you, but. But Genesis really, there's a lot that we're still kind of uncovering that's there. And I think that's a, a blast. Even Dr. Kip talks about there are things in Genesis that I'd, I'd have to get him up, you know, to come and actually explain this in depth. But in Genesis, I think it's 38. I think it's the story of Judah, if I'm not mistaken, has like later implications in the Bible. There's some, there's some like, anachronisms if you could use the term yeah. uh, that are there there's a lot of doublets there's fun ancient mesopotamian literature that you could see that they're getting ideas from and you on know, and on and on you know what i like about genesis everything you just said is like you can see where they stitch together stuff but besides all that the writers are trying to like show that there's this like there's like this generational spirit that goes down like joseph kind of becomes the new jacob and then jacob is the new abraham and they all they all have, there's like the twin motif that you keep seeing cain and abel jacob and esau yeah. uh isaac and ishmael and like the, every generation is like a repeat 
with like some sort of it's really hard to explain. I'm sure Scholar can explain it better than me, but they call those doublets or trip. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, there's a repeat like Sarah, the wife of Abraham is his sister. And then the the, the Pharaoh goes in to sleep with her and uh, and because uh, he doesn't want to get killed because she's attractive. According to the story, that same story gets told multiple times of Sarah and Abraham. Like, like, Hey, didn't we already come down to Egypt? Didn't the Pharaoh already try to sleep with my wife? Why are you repeating this exact same story within the Bible? So this is where you get into the whole documentary hypothesis where multiple sources are stitched together, even if they kind of sound confusing or don't make sense. But that, that tradition even goes down into his descendants. So I think it's Isaac and his wife who end up going to Egypt again, and the same crap yeah. happens. Yeah. This is the one case in Genesis where a triplet happens. Not a doublet, but a triplet. And uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman, in that lecture series on Genesis that I've been promoting, he goes into this and breaks it down, and he's like, he'll stop? You know what? Like, you start to get to know Bart Ehrman when he does these facial expressions. He'll go, um, and people um, actually think this happened. Uh, anyway... <laughs> Um, and then he moves on and it's like, yes, this is beautiful. So yeah. Genesis, it is. Yeah. Random noodle. Thank you for the super chat. During deconstruction, I tried prayer to other gods and even inanimate objects. It all had the same effect as blind chance. Did you ever try testing God? Yeah. Um, yeah, there was times. Well, I gave the exam. I gave the prime example. I, I, I said, listen, I'm. This is my my new church, and I want it to be true. I'm losing faith, but I'm like, I'm reading the text. The text says that if I give if I give a mustard seed, I can get you know what I mean. I can grow a whole tree. So I'm you like, can okay. move the mountain, yeah, and cast like, it into the sea, etc. Yeah. And I'm trying to put this in play. I'm trying to see if this is really true. And I'm like, but this is it. I'm giving you myself. I accept. I did. I, I literally said this. I accept you as my lord and savior mm -hmm. i said that shouldn't i be saved shouldn't the miracle happen i mean or did it like it, it doesn't make sense should i have died then would i be better off dying back then because it's just you you see what i'm saying and like that's my that's my answer to that that's my that was my test i guess you could call it yeah i, I i'd say i definitely tested god um on multiple accounts especially when i was a christian i would have these moments where people at school would you know, I was carrying my Bible around in high school. People wanted to like kind of go, dude, what are you doing? Wait till you're older to get into religion. Like, yeah. why are you doing this at such a young age? And I'm like, we don't have tomorrow. I was like a little apocalypticist. Like, I believe the, <laughs> the second coming was coming soon. I believe the end was near back in high school. And um, but I never really understood eschatology and getting into apocalypticism and stuff until later when I took that serious within Christianity. That was what that was the camel that broke or the, the straw that camel, <laughs> the straw that broke the camel's back. That was it. Getting into eschatology really opened up a whole world of problems. Christians cannot figure out the end. They don't understand it. They don't get it. It's, you know, these are problems that I found within the bubble, but I tested God um, years and years and years back as a Christian. But when I started to leave and I was saying prayers as I was deconverting, I started to kind of get into other philosophy, other things like we talked about, started looking at other ways to interpret these texts that made more sense, at least made better sense of what I've been told, or at least were alternate views of interpretation that to me made better sense of the data because I started seeing patterns and such in the Bible that um, I started to realize I'm talking to myself because none of the, none of the outcomes were actually happening but what I knew could happen is when I'd applied something or believed in myself to do something, it got accomplished because I applied it. I did it. I made it happen. I mean, I didn't go, may I win the lottery? Right. Uh, you know, like it was none of that that I started doing afterwards. But from time to time, this is total transparency. My mom is a serious believer and I love my mom to death. Right. From time to time, my mom will beg me to, to say a prayer and she'll beg me to, to mean it. And I mean it and I'll say a prayer and I'll say it like with my mom there on the phone. I'm not that kind of atheist, you know, where it's like, yeah. I'm just standing against all superstitions and I'm just not going to do it. No, I'll say it for my mom and like make her feel better. Right. You know, and make her comforted by me saying the prayer and I'll say it in Jesus name. I pray. Amen. 
and I'll mean it for my mom. But I, I, I'm past the point of thinking this is reality, that this is really what's going on, that these are, this is true. So I guess that would be an example of testing God in a way. Um, I, today, I left something out of my story that it's pretty interesting. So I try my, I have a friend from Lebanon who's a Shia Muslim, a Twelver they call it, the Twelvers. And I let, I was just fresh off of Christian, leaving Christianity dabbling around with other things. I remember for a little while I thought um, I believed in full blown predetermination. Everything's cause and effect. And we're just playing. We're just, we're just like NPCs. Right. So then let, it kind of made me want to test out Islam a little bit. So I went with him to one, to his imam. It was in the, it was in the bottom of some basement somewhere. A bunch of like t- bunch of um, rugs hanging up and they're all beating their chests. This is like some like it was like some holy day of the year where someone died. Some girl, I don't remember her name. She got killed. Someone put someone hit her with a door. That's how she died. And there was this is the celebration of that day. That was the happened to be the day I went there. And they're all crying and beating their chest and, and singing in Arabic. And I'm just sitting like this. <laughs> <laughs> I never went back. <laughs> That's what my wife thought Her about us. <laughs> When we were speaking in tongues at these charismatic churches, um, my wife thought that about us. She's like, this is weird. She was not into that at all. But but that's what I was – I see – this is what I'm saying. I was trying. You I was trying. trying to find God. I'm not I, I'm not just a bullshitter. I really was. Yeah, no, I know. And that's the – I, that's why I put on the thumbnail jokingly, you just want to sin right. or you're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And that's all it is. You just don't want it to be true. You just hate God. You hear these same slogans. Let me give a little advice to the Christians who are out there that might be watching who hear this. There are Christians you should listen to because you're not going to listen to me probably. But there are Christians, I will say, that would say the same thing. Stop saying that. That's not helping. That's not true. Uh, it's, it really makes you look even like you don't have a sufficient answer to the problems. And while that might be true for some people, the reasons we've left, if you've listened to this entire episode, none of us went, man, I really enjoyed the strip club on uh, Sunday night. Uh, and I, I couldn't go to church on that day, uh, feeling guilty. So I decided to leave Christianity because let me tell you, those women knew how to swing on those poles. Uh, no, I'm a married man. I have three kids. I mean, let's be honest. Like, no, it was never that. I've, um, there were problems with how I was living my life as an addict while I was a Christian and how I didn't understand how I had God's Holy Spirit. Why are you I really- mean, I had been baptized. I had, you know, depending on the version of Christianity, I pretty much tested many different versions of Christianity. And I believed I had the Holy Spirit, which is supposed to empower you. And yet I'm... I'm not able to have self-control enough to not be addicted to drugs or alcohol. And my father was an alcoholic. So we got down to a point where years and years of suffering with addiction, thinking it was a demon or my spiritual malady, I didn't have enough spirituality or I wasn't being true or there was something wrong spiritually. I realized there's some science behind this and I have a real problem. There's some actual science that can help me not, it isn't a spiritual issue. There's something that's physical. There's a physiological right. problem. There's probably genetic disposition to these things. Once I started realizing that, and that solved that investigating that from a scientific angle and understanding what was going on in my brain from my frontal lobal cortex to my midbrain, there was a disconnect, misfiring neurons in the fr- where my decision-making process is taking place. I had learned a lot about my brain and realized why I was making bad decisions Once you start to know some science a little, you start to realize they've been feeding me a load of shit. Like they don't even know it. They, they think this is true, but they don't have this genetic disposition or they don't have the social issue. They weren't growing up in, let's say, an, a alcoholic household where drug addiction is prevalent and became an addict themselves. I had to deal with this. So they don't understand me. And once I realized that, man, it goes deep. There's a lot of like internal struggle. Like how did God, God, I've begged you. I've cried you countless nights. I used to go up just to give you a real TMI, too much information here, but I'm very transparent. Uh, As a youth, I loved as a youth. I mean, I'm a young man with, with hormones and whatnot. I watched pornography all the freaking. it's all I could do. 
And I'd go to this youth thing at my school. It was at my public school. They had this Christian group called Trojans for Christ. And I'd go down there and they'd pray for me. And almost every other day I'd have to go down there and be prayed for again because I'd slip up. And I was trying to resist something that was completely natural and right. normal, what they call the flesh. Right. And it was like, no, whoa. For years, I kept beating myself up. Why am I this filthy flesh of mine? I can't stop it. Why am I doing And this is what Paul, I think, is maybe crying out in the New Testament, you know, is his flesh, the thorn in his flesh. It may be a sexual thing, as James Tabor said and other people said. Um and I go down there and get prayed for, and it didn't work. And I meant it. I would cry. I would, you, you can't fake this. This shit was real. And then the next thing you know, I'm back at it. I can't stop. What is wrong with me? Why am I on drugs? Why am I on alcohol? What is going on with me? And yeah. I kept resisting that. And the more I resisted it, it became more of an obsession. Yeah. Then one day I realized, did you know that you evolved? You're part of the animal kingdom. And man, I felt so much relief to realize. No wonder. No wonder I had these inclinations, these these passions, these natural desires. Right. Sorry for the story time with Derek, but I no, had to lay no. it out there, bro, because it's true. It's a fact. It's, it's just it's we're, we're designed that way. We're designed to have that sort of like that's what we do. Yeah, it's totally normal. And uh, that was one of the internal things that made me really wrestle in my faith, but I never left because of it. I never became a skeptic, an atheist because of my sin. If anything, it drove me further into trying to believe and finding salvation and help and whatnot. It never drove me away from it. And I still thought I said design that way. I didn't, you know, I'm the way I know I what mean, you mean. Yeah. But, well, but like, but like the funny part about that pun though, is like, if it was our fault, who made us that way, right? Yeah, of course. Our ancestor, Adam uh, and oh, yeah. Eve. Oh, no, blame it on the woman, right? Of course. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Micah, thank you so much for the super chat. Do you think we live in a simulation? I don't, personally. <laughs> no. but... I actually, I fl flirted with this idea, like, you know, as my deconverted. <laughs> but I had Lawrence Cross on, and I really wanted to dive into this. Like, I want, like, I didn't, at that point, I was already, didn't think so. But I just wanted to. I wanted to get in on this idea and he totally just showed me that this is just mm. complete, you know, so no. Well, I, uh, I definitely think it's interesting to think about. It's like a fun philosophical yeah. exercise type thing. Like what yeah. if we've made it this far, you know, we might make it, we might've been here a long time ago or this, this we're in the simulation of course. And I think it's fun to think that way, but, I have not seen any glitches. I haven't seen anything for me to think that reality is not just the natural world that we live in. And they can go, well, I grant all that. And we're still in a simulation where naturalism is the thing. Like, I, I don't know why to posit it. It's almost like if I just, lack of, the way you said it, I haven't seen any glitches. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm making the point. Cause I'll talk about like, I've seen glitches. yeah, I've heard people say, I saw a glitch in it that your deja vu is a deja glitch. That's a yeah. Glitch. Yeah. 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 Glitch in the matrix. I personally don't. So um, thank you for that super chat, though. Jakey Pake, thank you for the super chat, my friend. Did either of you ever consider Islam after doubting Christianity? Islam is, of course, even crazier than Christianity, but you've come across a few ex Christians who went that route. I, like I just said, that was my, I just said that. I didn't even read this yet. But yeah, I, I literally went to that imam and. Just wanted to just wanted to see what it was, see what it's about. Just I just didn't feel it. Wasn't feeling it. Didn't feel right. So sorry. I didn't go that route. Um I started to investigate from a different path. I mean, I started in Christianity, right? I didn't exhaust the world religions to find the truth, but I did start seeing comparative religion and saw patterns and realized, okay, hold on. This little bubble I've been living in is wrong. And once I started realizing that bubble was wrong and saw a bigger picture, my God became bigger. Uh, and I started to kind of consider pantheism or some panentheism idea. All is one like you talked about. Uh, I wasn't doing drugs anymore when I came to this conclusion. So I didn't have the mushrooms talking in my head, making me hallucinate to think this. But I started to kind of draw that conclusion and realize why are humans working in these patterns? Why does nature 
work in these patterns and we evolve with these ideas. Even though I started to believe in evolution, which by the way, I started to believe in it because I didn't believe in it, uh, meaning I started to consider facts and data. I didn't have all this kind of wrapped in, in my head. I didn't quite figure all this stuff out. It was over time of investigating more that I started realizing, okay, if everything is and everything is the divine and you can't tell it apart from this cup is its cup and well, that's God or that's part of the divine or whatever. I realized what's the difference between everything just being natural and not having a God there or everything is God. How could I tell the difference? And at this point I was able to ask those questions without uh, me dangling over a flame of hell forever and ever. So I could ask questions that I wasn't afraid of the conclusions. That's why venturing into the truth was, was possible. I couldn't do that when I thought I was going to hell, but, but Islam never was on the scene for me uh, as an option. It was only later that I found people making truth claims that were Muslims on these videos here on myth vision, where they were saying stuff that sounded like a Christian apologist fundamentalist, but they were Muslim. And I went, there's a pattern here. Like they're dogmatic. They've got a fundamentalist ax to grind proving that this is true. And I started saying, I guess I need to find out the origins of Islam as well and get into how this tradition developed, where it comes from, why did it come into existence? And that's where I'm exploring it today. And I found when I started reading in Islam, how, how much they borrowed from Byzantine legends, dual Carnain, the horned one sounds a lot like the Alexander romance, the seven sleepers story sounds like the sleepers in El Kaf chapter, uh, the Iblis not being, or not wanting to bow to Adam. We see that in the Nakamati, Nakamati text where Azazel won't bow to Adam. So I was like blown away by that. That was like, this is crazy. Yeah. And it's like, you could see how Islam pulled off what Christianity pulled off mm -hmm. to the Jews. Like they did, it's just like another, and like Mormonism is like another layer of that. Like I've heard a joke from, from, it was actually some a YouTuber who was a rabbi. And he says, he said, uh, God made Mormons so that Christians can know how Jews feel. Okay, that, that's so good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, man. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. I like the uh, I like how you put that, and yeah, I do see that. I, the recent interview I did with Peter von Sivers, uh, though I know some of the other academic Muslim scholars or Islamic scholars that I have, I won't say Muslim scholars because they're not Muslim. So, uh, but they are Islamic scholars. May disagree with some of his points. Overall, there is this growing in Western scholarship, this growing idea that it was Christianity this thing came out of as a reaction to certain Christologies. And that really caught my attention because the whole dealing with the hypostatic union of Christ, he's a hundred percent man and a hundred percent God. No, he's a hundred percent man, not God. No, he's a hundred percent divine and not man. That wrestling that goes on within the Nag Hammadi library, the, the, the texts that we find in the Gnostic literature to various forms of Arianism and whatever different kinds of early Christianities you might find that really piqued my interest. And then I asked you, Dr. Peter von Sievers, like, hey, what about this literature? Didn't it get stamped out and it stopped existing by the time they're burying this literature in Alexandria, Egypt? And he says, no, like maybe right near Constantinople, but not out here in Arabia in these areas where the literature has widespread and went viral. Like it's out there. And they're they're reading this stuff in the 6th, 7th century. There's no reason not to think so. So thank you so much for that. We rabbit trail when you super chat us. Uh, James, uh, Apperson, Apperson, I always mess up your name in my head, but thank you for the super chat. James, have you ever seen the music vid dear God from Dax? Yes, I have. It's about the needless internal struggle with God baggage. Christianity saddles us with. Have you seen it? Uh, I'll have to check that out. It sounds pretty good. It's actually really interesting. He, there's a couple moments in there. The lyrics really grab my attention where he's like, what if it, it, it's like, what if Everything. Let me get the lyrics. Dear God, sure. I'll pop it up. Trust me. Dax. Yeah, I, I always w wonder why you're looking for that. So just so we're not someone saying something. Oh, yeah. so I, always, I always wonder how can you create some. Imagine you create something, a robot or anything, and it, it malfunctions. Can you imagine blaming the thing that you created for its malfunction and then condemning it to eternal eternal suffering unless it figures out the version of you that's the right one? 
I mean, that's where there, there's so many things you said that I can already, and my Christian me will try to attack it back because I know what the Christians would say. Everything you just said was totally wrong. You started with the wrong assumption that we're robots. You don't realize libertarian free will is the case here. Don't you understand? God made us with free will. Don't blame God, yada, yada, yada. And it's, there's like, you might as well just become an open theist and say, God didn't realize what was going to happen. We right. definitely didn't realize what was going to happen. And God lives with certain moral attributes that he's required to live by. So now we're kind of all screwed. And even God couldn't have prevented what happened. That's your best bet. Go ahead and just become an open theist. I'm sick and tired of the whole Molinism sit in the middle, find a way to say all actions were known were going to happen, but God had to let them happen. So they're really actually free, but he knew they were going to happen and he had a plan about all of it. Dude, the level at which Molinism and predestinarianism and all this crap goes into, if you're really trying to find a way to get God off the hook, make sure God does not know everything and that he's not all powerful, omniscient. Get rid of the omnis. And the pagans. yeah, at least the yeah. pagans have that going for them where they can say, well, Zeus kind of sucks sometimes. So that's yeah. why you have set. That's why you have, uh, you know, Pluto and you have Poseidon and Hera and they just all kind of they can explain. They can explain evil that way. Yeah. Make it a struggle amongst gods. Right. Make it make it something like that. I mean, that's kind of what ends up happening in early Christianity with dualism between Satan and God. Now they can blame Satan instead of blaming God. There's a lot of ways to get God off the hook. Zoroastrians. So um, this is this is the Dax song. I'm trying to find out where he's like, all right, why are there why is there only one? you but multiple religion why why does every conversation end in division why why does everybody want to tell us how to live but they won't listen to the same damn message that they give tell me how to feel tell me what's wrong i tried to call pick up the phone he's talking to god i'm on my own everybody said you're coming back then man why the hell's it taking so long this is good yeah uh, why do i hurt why why is there pain why does everything good always have to change why does everybody try to profit off another man's work, then destroy it just for monetary gain? Tell me, are you black or are you white? I don't even really care. I just really want to know what's right. I don't care. They've been saying one thing, but I've been looking in the book, and it seems like they've been lying. This is what we've been saying in this entire episode it, um, for my, my whole damn life. Tell me where I'm going. Where? Is it heaven or hell? I just hope this message greets you well. Had a dream that I was walking with the devil. Don't remember how it feels, but I swear that I remember the smell. Looked me right into my eye and told me everything I wanted could be mine if I gave up and decided to sell. But I said I'd rather die than get mine. Now I'm here. No fear. One man with a story to tell. It, if I'm not mistaken, there is... Hmm. It sums up my whole There's entire... An, my whole struggle. Oh, here. Sorry. There's more. I thought I was thinking... Oh, yeah. That, well, yeah. Dear God, where you been? I needed it. When I fucked up and repeated it. When they set the bar, I exceeded it. Where were you? My life is like a book that they've been judging by a cover, but have never took the time to fucking read the shit. I remember telling you my goals and my dreams, but you didn't even answer, so I guess you didn't believe in it. I remember sitting with a gun to my head trying to ask you for some help, but I guess you didn't believe in it. I don't want religion. I need spirituality. I don't want a church. I need people to call a family. I don't want to tell my sins to another sinner just because he's got a robe and he went to some academy. I don't want to read it in a book. I want to hear it from you. Don't want to learn it in my school because they hide in the truth. Swear. Don't want to talk about it to another fucking human being. And that's the only reason that I ever stepped in this booth. Dear God, how do I take this darkness and turn it into light? Talk to me. How do I believe in a concept where I speak to a man I've never seen with my own two eyes? How? How do I know that religion wasn't made just to separate the world and create a whole disguise just to keep us in these chains while the rich get richer and the poor pray to you and per perpetrate a lie? How do I know this ain't some big joke? How, how can I have faith when there is no hope? How the hell does one man have $100 billion and we still have people on the street that are broke? There's a lot of things I want to talk about and get off my chest. I can't sleep because the devil won't let me rest. I used to know I'm going to stop cussing just to try and keep it from getting demonetized. But right. I used to know a pastor in a church and I could I could still hear the screams of the kids. He won't he would uh, effing molest. Dear God, do you hear me? 
Do you hear me? I'm supposed to fear you, but you ain't said anything. So, uh, so maybe it's you who actually fears me. I don't know the answer. I just want to see it clearly. So many lies. There's a thousand different theories. All I want to know is who really made religion because I know it wasn't you. But don't nobody believe me. No more lies. No more death. Bring back King. Bring back X. Please, dear God, let their souls rest. Protect who's left and watch their steps. Dear God, dear God, I don't want to have to ask you again. I just hope that you know that I'm still a believer. So I'll end this by saying amen. So this is one video that, or one music video that he did, Dear God. He has another one where it's the end of the world. And I thought it was a really interesting episode. But at the end of the day, like he's still believing in it. Right. Like he has, like he, he can't picture a that's possible I, world without it. Yeah. That's how I felt at the end when I told you about that last baptism. I'm sitting there and I'm like, I want this to be true. I'm accepting salvation, the free salvation from the death of Christ. I want that. Give me it. What else? What do I need to do? Like, I thought this was supposed to be free, right? Do I have to earn it? Like, what, what do I have to do? That, so I can identify with those lyrics being like, where are you at? Mm. You know what I mean? I definitely relate to that. The song that really caught my attention wasn't that one. It was from, um, uh, what is his name? I'll, I'll, it, dude, my brain is all messed up. So I'd have to actually find him. Um, you try to read your mind and figure it out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he did some stuff with NF. Uh, he's done stuff with Eminem. Um, Oh, I it'll think, come to me. Yeah. It'll come to me at some point. But he did one on about about God, and he's literally screaming out like, like the absurdities of like from an apple uh, and eating an apple from a tree and all of this stuff in the rap. It's really good, and he's out in the desert in the scene. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh come on, I can't remember now. I, that's the problem. Like I don't yeah. know how. Yeah, try and find that, and I'm going right. to take the next super chat. Craig and Ford, thank you so much, my friend John F. White. Go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Brilliant. He's into the mythologies, especially the Proto-Indo-European ones going into Zeus, or not Zeus, sorry, Odin, Thor, etc. Really. Go ahead. I just had him on. I just dropped the video with him this morning. Let me, awesome. let me share it. Let me show that. We get, okay. into, we get into the Odin, the Odinic mysteries, Odin hanging himself for nine days, who the Sky Father is. He's a great guest, by the way. And you were the one who introduced me to him, so thank you for that. Yeah, man. This one right here, The Dying God, Odinic yeah. Mysteries, yes. Dragon Ford. It's a good one. You got. But by the way, Hobson is what you're thinking of. Hobson. Yes. You got to figure it out. That's the dude. And in fact, it's it's Ill of Mind 7. Now that you said his name, I can remember that. Ill of Mind. Was, you're right. That was a good one. That was this is one. the one right here where he's Ill of Mind 7. He's in the desert and yes. he's crying out the whole time. You said that, desert? It popped right in my head. Yeah, I knew exactly who it was. This is a great song. Yeah. I loved his hot Illamine five too, but because yeah. I came out of drug addiction as well. But that one right there really it just it hits home. What many views does that have? Uh 73 million. Woo! It deserves it. Yeah, he's he should get more. More people should kind of ask questions. All right, let's get his super chat. Have you ever considered heathen heathenry? Hang from a tree for nine nights, uh sacrificing yourself to yourself. Heard it allows you to find esoteric knowledge. <laughs> oh, snap. Is this what you guys talked about? Some of this yeah. stuff? Yeah, we got into that deeply into that. We got, we just, me... we exhausted. Well, I shouldn't say we exhausted it because it can get even deeper. And he, I know he knows more. Like, there's so much you can say about the Proto Indo European, Sky Father, Odin, Thor, Tyr. And he, it, like, you could go, he, especially Kraken for, he can go for hours. That's why he has his channel. Like, he mm -hmm. knows. He's he's a scholar. He's legit. Yeah. You know yeah. I mean? Oh yeah, for sure. And I just posted right. it for anybody the actual video that he did with Gnostic Informant. Let me grab his YouTube channel real quick, just so everybody can go there. Yes, um, subscribe to that if you like. If you like proto into European mythology, comparative religion. If you're into Odin, Thor, like really the oldest myths we can account for, you're going to want to check him out. Yeah, this is one stop shop. Yeah, this he is all over this and he knows how to sift through the material because the problem that you find when you get into this, as me and John have talked about, and I'm sure you might have mentioned with him or he maybe have, has mentioned to you, is there is a lot of 
racism involved in the study of Odin and Thor. There's a lot of European type people, if you will, that actually want to go and apply themselves. In fact, there's a church 20 miles down the road. It's a church or holy building, whatever you want to call it, um, where they believe they're going back before Christianity messed up the whole European stuff, according to them. They're going back to their roots and finding their roots in Odin and Thor and getting back to their original message or whatever it's the, um, Aryan, it's the Aryan movement and it's very yeah. anti-semitic very anti-semitic yeah it's the same movement that with the nazi that started the nazis like right so right yeah and i, I was blown away that they were 20 miles from me like holy smokes but uh did i put i didn't post it did i but but we should make it clear there's a lot of a lot of people who follow that tradition who aren't like that yeah i mean like any religion you know you have yeah. people who are probably bad and good and in, in all of them. Uh, but he knows how to sift through it. My point yeah. is, and he is not like them. Right. Uh, he actually is getting down to the data as a scholar and not bringing it as a religious. Um, he's not bringing like, Hey, this is my race. This is my religion. And I'm going to yeah. prove everybody wrong. No, but he loves getting into the myth. Like we do here at myth vision. Right. Thank you for that. I just posted his YouTube channel and uh, please subscribe to him. Show him some love especially for helping support us here at Myth Vision. All right, Mr. Monster, good to see you here, my friend. One of my coworkers asked me if I have ever asked God if he was real. I told them I sure did when I was younger a lot. God said yes back then. Now I know it was my own mind that said yes, I am God. Nice. nice. <laughs> yeah, you can kind of hear your own voice. Uh, Steven Pinker? I can't remember who it was. He gets into the language, the evolution of language in humans. It wasn't him. There was someone else who asked this profound question in, in a lecture back, I don't know, maybe in the 30s, 40s, or 50s. I remember hearing the audio. It might have been later than that. And um, he said, when man developed speech and we learned how to communicate per speech, I wonder if man heard the voice in his own head of him talking and thought, who is that in my head? You know, who is this in my head? That's uh, hold on one second. Here you go, baby. She had to get the keys. Uh, who is that in my head? That that's God. You know, there's something talking inside of my head. Right. And uh, that's we now know that like, you can talk to yourself. You can think out loud inside of your head, even. Um, and sometimes those can be audible when you hallucinate. There's audible hallucinations that take place inside of your head. So there's there's this idea. I think that's where God is in that idea. It's really a higher you discussing with yourself. Yeah. That's my honest thoughts. Yeah. And I'm sure in the ancient world, if someone was schizophrenic, there might have been some parts of the world, I don't know, like druids or something. I'm just throwing stuff out there. That might have thought that was some sort of divine power. Like put him in a priestly position. He's hearing stuff. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. this, might, this might be prophecies. Who knows? Like, you know, people probably play with that a lot, too. Mental health and how that stuff. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, they, didn't know. they didn't know any better, you know? Richard Carrier writes in his book on the historicity about this hallucinations and people who are uh, people who are prone to experience, like, even uh, maybe even seizures, right? Like, they're possessed by a deity. It isn't always negative, right? Like, when you hear the word daemon, we call it demon. Um, Plato had a demon. Aristotle had a demon. It didn't mean they were evil. It, this was a neutral term for uh, kind of like what we call guardian angel. Yeah. And when you when you start to get into that, you wonder, is this there in their head? Are they imagining this? I think they are. But right. uh, it's really interesting to get into in the ancient world. Madalia, good to see you no, here. I'm Long not. time no see. And thank you for the support, the super chat. Hi, are you curious why there is little zero original text, Bible, Greek, Roman? Plus, have you heard Egyptian Sumerian tablets were found in the U.S.? There is a suppression of the history for religion. Why? Yeah, the, the Sumerian tablets thing. I don't know why. I'm, that's, I don't, I've never heard of that in the U.S. That would be wild. That would be some wild stuff. I've, I remember hearing about somebody finding something, but it got criticized. Because it's like, like, all right, we have a little tablet by itself with nothing else around it. So people are like, what probably got planted there. I remember hearing something like that, but mm -hmm. it was, it was not like, it was very quick. I mean, uh, there could be something I don't know, obviously, but about the text, why is there no originals? 
that's well one for one you have to there's, there's they have to copy stuff the ancient world didn't have freezers they didn't have fax machines they have to copy stuff and pass it down so but it brings up the interesting thing is how do we know that the copies that of the copies of the copies are legit mm-hmm. bart Ehrman's the best one to go to when, when it comes to that topic because talking about the new testament literature he's and like, jesus yeah yeah absolutely as far as original text it doesn't surprise me uh especially when you're going to start transmitting literature out people are copying this literature they may not need the older stuff so a lot of papyri and things like that is is going to wear out but the interesting thing about the akkadian sumerian uh babylonian if you will uh tablets is often they're clay tablets like we do have original actual tablets clay tablets from these places i've talked to joshua bowen and that's the cool thing you can get right back to the beginning of like no we have clay tablets of things that go right back to when they were created um i don't know if we would have an original flood myth right of babylon or whatever because they're developing from previous flood myths and those are developing from previous and they're all using each other yeah they're all separate tablets but it's not like the tablet's just going to wear out right uh like or like papyri or something you got the descent of anana which is pretty pretty darn old it's like (laughs) that is almost like third or fourth millennium bc and this is this is talking about anana going down into the, the, the underworld saving tamos bringing him up going down there for three days bringing him up and raising the dead with tamos like that's a motif that sounds pretty familiar right yeah i mean obviously it's agricultural but yeah. but either way that's the point no, right. exactly. that's why derek bennett came on and was talking about this this evolution of resurrection as an idiom you know it it, it takes on a new new meaning over time like if, if if we go far enough back, resurrection was never really about us being resurrected from the dead. It was about agriculture and the new seasons and the times and whatnot so that we could have crops and plant, et cetera. And this is where I think they would a- apply their own personal experience into the world around them. And polytheism made the best sense of the world around them. Right. They didn't imagine one person at work doing all this. There were many gods, uh, the lightning god, the thunder, the volcano god, the whatever. But the idea of dying and rising is is a natural nature thing eventually now you have christians out of nowhere start saying we're going to physically rise from the dead and we're actually going to have a new body etc cetera, etc cetera. when did it go from this to this well you could actually see a an in the middle sort of because the romans had the illusionian illusionian mysteries clearly it's clearly a polemic to the mysteries of Ishtar and Inanna, clearly. Like I've read this in Mary Beard's work where she points this out. There's clearly they're bo- they're clearly um inspired by this. And um it's the it's, it's almost the same myth with Demeter instead of uh, instead of Ishtar. And then it's uh Persephone goes down in the Hades. She's she's she needs to get saved from down there. Anyways, long story short, in in the rit- in the rituals, taking part and in being initiated actually lets you rise up in the underworld with Persephone. So there was already, they're already starting to lean towards salvation. It's not like personal salvation yet. It's still an initiation thing, Mm -hmm. but you can see the, the culture starting to move towards the direction of that salvation. You know what I mean? Yeah. That an analogy I'm aware of and could really get into detail, I guess, explaining is the development and evolution of God in philosophy that 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 evolving form of god where now they're reading the text and they say well our understanding today is god is omni 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 all powerful all knowing all this all that so when you get to a text where god doesn't know something what do you do well he knows everything so he can't not know so when he says it it's an anthropomorph anthropomorphism where God is just trying to relate to the fickle little human that he can't, he can't express everything that he is to. So he's like, Adam, where are you? Adam, I really know where you are, but I just want you to say where you are. But I'm saying it in language that if anyone in common with common sense read that without the, the anachronistic all knowingness of God, you wouldn't read that and think God actually knows where Adam is. No, 
He's asking him where he is because he doesn't know where he's at. You you have to push your newer ideas yeah. back into something that did not have this conception of God. And that evolution happens, I think, with resurrection. So when people look at the resurrection idea and they say, those are dying, rising gods in agriculture. That's, that is not, that has nothing to do with resurrection. That's true. The evolution of this thought took place and it, the idiom has evolved just like our philosophy and understanding of God and everything else in the culture has changed. So these are the things that make me go, okay, um, why is there such resistance to any comparison to dying and rising deities? Because they're not Xerox copies and they don't mean exactly the same thing. I agree. It is about this archetype and this evolution that takes place of these ideas. So anyway. Absolutely. Doc Pleromonaut, thank you again for the super chat. To be fair, the Illusion Mysteries followers drink Kukion? Kukion, yeah. As an ancient scissor. Pretty, pretty much. To kick in the experience. Yeah, it's a hallucinogen mixed with wine. And um, and that's where that's where Bacchus comes in, because he in the myth he he goes and visits Eleusis, the city of Eleusis, with Demeter, so that's how it becomes illusion and mysteries where they're combining the Orphic, the Bacchic Orphic, with these Demeter. Anyways, long story short, when you drink that the drink, Bacchus is entering you, and you're becoming like he's he takes you over. He you get in that Bacchic frenzy basically. He, you know what I mean? He's the vine. He's that, like, that's what that is. Yeah. That, uh, Dennis McDonald really blows me away when he talks about this. And he says, as in Euripides, the Bacchae with uh, Dionysus, where Dionysus makes old men young again, right? right? Well, what happens when you drink? I know all too well what, the, what happens. And I think I'm harder than I am and I'm, I'm ready to kick some ass or whatever. Well, Jesus does the same thing, but it, it, it takes a different spin. It, it's not about getting drunk and now this old man feels young. It's one of the miraculous things where they're taking someone who's old and making them young again or making them revived and whatnot. So there's a lot of things I think Dennis is on to, onto that are just kind of ignored or not known in academia. Right. Yeah. Crossover Maniac. Thank you for that super chat, my friend. Have you heard the theory that agricultural gods were the origin of transubstantiation as their body was the grain harvest and their blood was beer from the fermented grain. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If you look uh, at Osiris, right? Yeah. The, the best book on this, and I, I, a lot of people don't roll their eyes, but James Fraser's The Golden Bug. He is a bit, he, it's a great book. Not everything he says is up to date, right? It's, this is, this is an older book from a century ago, I think but there's so much good mind um, stimulating stuff in there that'll make you dig into the history where he talks about Osiris and Demeter being corn God and goddesses. And that in Egypt, when corn would grow at har or, um, whatever harvest or springtime, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that was, that was um, the phallus of Osiris getting an erection during that time of the year. So you can see yeah. how they are identifying the God with the agriculture and like that's as clear as it gets right there. The golden, the golden bow, Sir yes. James Fraser. Yep. Okay. Just I have a copy right over here. So yeah, you can see it in the background. <laughs> I'm just, someone was asking in the chat and I'm looking yeah, to yeah. see if James there's Fraser. a, I'll comment the, uh, I'll put the Amazon link in there just so people can have fun with this. But yeah, there's a lot, bro. You know what really blew my mind? How much sexual stuff is yeah. in these ancient mythologies. Like, it blows my mind. And that book, where do I have that book at? Eh, it's somewhere on the shelf over here. I got uh, it's somewhere over here where my lights are over here. But oh wow, you got a lot, dude. Damn. Yeah, I've been filling it in, man. Uh, it's kind of blurry there. Let me do this here. Um did I did it? Did I put the auto on? Yeah, I did. Oh man, it's just too dark. Let's see. Anyway, yeah, there's there's a mess over here. But anyway, um okay, you see the golden bug? See it? Yes, yes. <laughs> the Gnostic Bible. You got Eusebius. <laughs> yeah, look at it. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I. that one. Oh, here, let me just grab it real quick. Yeah, sure. Oh, now you're, now you're seeing me in my face. Up in my face. Up in you my grill. Of course, I always oh, keep yeah. plugging oh, Francesca. Great book. I got it too. Huh? 
I got I got the red copy of that. The, I okay. Don't know, I don't know how you got the cool. You got the cool. <sighs> I told you, man. The gods are looking out for me. They want me to. They want me to have the cool one. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that book. She gets into so it's not just the God of the Hebrew Bible. Like she gets into some strange stuff in the New Testament with Jesus. You know, Jesus washing feet. Okay, what's going on here? Um, there might be something, there might be stuff going on, is what she's saying. Because a lot of times there's idioms and, and words, they'll use a word to mean something else, possibly. And they used to have art that depicted Jesus nude when he was crucified. So you actually used to, and you know, when they first started doing the art images in Christianity of, of Jesus crucified, he was not covered up. Later on, they covered him up. They didn't. They didn't like having. Because they, that's how they crucified people in the ancient Roman world, right. naked. That was supposed to be humiliating and the worst way to go. So that's the. That was a real depiction of. But that's their god. They're not going to show a god humiliated. But that's yeah. what happened. That's if they, if he's historical. I'm sorry to say that's what happened. Well, even if he isn't as portrayed, this right. is what happened. So exactly. even if you were a mythicist, you still have this. Yep, it's uh, not looking good for this guy uh, here, wherever you want to say he's crucified. But yeah, I, I think she's on to some really interesting things because it doesn't just limit itself to the ancient Near East. It goes down into the first century and the ideas that are surrounding in the culture. She's really brilliant. But I, one of the things you talk about Osiris and erection and, you know, Isis literally finds his um, phallus or creates and invents a phallus of. One. Yep. Yeah, it just. What the? I told my wife that she goes, Stop. Like, I'm not even kidding. Goes, stop. You're making up crap. Stop. I'm like, I'm making this up. No, you don't realize it is, <laughs> it is so sexual. It's so ridiculously sexual in the ancient Near East. Well, do you, do you know there's a myth? I don't know if it's in the Book of the Dead. It's in one of those Tales of Sinu or something, one of those ancient from like 2000 BC Egyptian texts where it says that set ejaculated in Horace's behind. Like, right? It's, what? It literally says you that. You find these texts, too. Yeah, you, I'm, you, I'm telling you, there's crazy stuff in the ancient Egyptian world. Set. They had no shame. They had no. Get out of here. Right. Get out of here. I'm trying to sneak up behind me. See, you, <laughs> it's crazy. you say his name. It's like Beetlejuice. You say it too many times, he's, he's going to pop up. Um, I did want to just end on this super chat and say, the blood and wine Dionysus had this in the mysteries, of course, of Dionysus with Euripides Bacchae, we know is older than the first century. This goes back third to fifth century BC, where they would practice chewing the flesh of the meat and drinking the, the wine, which was the blood. Uh, I don't know if the blood was literal at one point and eventually became, you know, uh, wine. Who knows if you go far enough back? But uh, th that's also something practiced in the Osung beer and eating cornbread as his flesh. So there's something going on there. And it is not coincidence. It is purposeful that Jesus has something like this in the New Testament, especially when it's literally contrary to the Jewish law that you can eat and drink blood of anything living. You're not allowed to do that. So there's an absolute clear Something from the outside is coming in. There's just no way about it. You have to do that. Vita, Matt, thank you so much for the super chat. Gents, keep doing what you're doing here on YouTube. I appreciate both of your channels greatly. Thanks to you both. I have now achieved true gnosis. Yes. You know, By the way, this merch out right now. I, I should probably mention like when that started that you, 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 me and you, we've talked for a while now and I'm like, bro, I believe in you, man. You, you really have the potential I say that told you this when you didn't have anybody, you know, you just started and I was like, bro, you've got a lot of insights and you love reading this stuff. You're not just some, I could speak, but I don't read and learn what I'm doing. You're into what you do. I think I had 500, maybe even less than that, maybe 200 or something subscribers. Yeah. And I reached out to you trying to interview, just trying to get, you know, I'm trying to interview people. You were, and you're, you seem like a good person candidate you know we have a lot in common i knew that you had the history with your you know you, we had a very similar drug know, addiction yeah legal problems right yeah all of that and then 
I was following your footsteps a little bit, you know, learning from you, watching your channel, watching you and Dr. Bob. So I, I reached out to interview you and, um, bro, you were like, you know what? I think you could do this. I think you're going to make it. Let me, let me, uh, introduce you to a couple scholars. You introduced me to, to uh, Dennis McDonald right away. Dr. Bob right away. Uh, Derek, Derek, um, Bennett. Bennett. Yeah. You, you helped me out, man. Like this is like, I, I would not be where I'm at. Like my channel owes everything to mid vision. Nah, bro, you you deserve every bit of it, and you work very hard. You help me uh, edit videos. Like, bro, I've been doing this for years now, and it can get tiring. So, like, as much as I do, it's difficult to pump out this amount of content and put the kind of level of editing skills into it. And it's tit for tat, man. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's Romulus and Remus, but we're not going to kill each other at the end. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're um, Romulus. I'm Remus. It's a new online empire. Let's just put it that way, where we're we're trying to get people to think about these things yeah. and and appreciate the mythology. I don't care at the end of the day what your ontology is. You think there's something there, and and you believe in a higher power, and there's something greater. You know, we all have something that we hold on to. And for me, it's it's me and the social environment of people I have, including you online. You play a part of this. But I've come to kind of realize and internalize, I think there's natural explanations for these. and But I still have psychological satisfaction in me. It's that it's that old parable that I, I've said before, and I'll say it again since we've got people here. And this was, for me, what what I started to do. When God went to make man, he was speaking out loud. And Satan could overhear him. Now, this is not written in any holy book. I literally, this parable was something that I heard and I kind of formed it in my own way. And he heard Satan say, I'm going to make man ambitious, driven, intelligent, all of the attributes that are good, wise, powerful, you know, just like me, he said. So Satan's like, all right, I've got to hide God from man. So when man's here, he'll never be able to find God. So he hides God. He says, I'm going to hide God beneath the mountains, deep, deep in the earth. Man will never find him there. Next thing you know, he thinks hard about what God says about man. Like he'll be motivated. He'll be driven. He'll be, he'll be ambitious, et cetera, et cetera. Very smart. He'll find a way to remove the rocks, unearth the mountains and get beneath them. And he'll find God. I can't hide God there. Where can I hide God? I'll hide God beneath the oceans, under the water. Beneath the sand, man will never find him. And he thinks hard about everything God said about him. He says, no, 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 no. You know what? He'll find an apparatus. He'll get beneath the water. He'll sweep away the sand and he'll find God. I can't hide him there. Where can I hide God? And this is me through my deconversions phase. I'm literally getting into the esoterics. I'm starting to think pantheism, God is everything and everywhere ideas are starting to become something. And then I started to get into science and start looking at maybe natural explanations. And I just want to say that as I'm telling this parable. Then the last thing Satan finally realizes, I can't hide him there. Where can I hide him? I got it. I'll hide God inside of every person. They'll always be looking outward, searching, trying to find God in the stars, in the mountains, beneath the seas, you name it, and never for one moment just stop, be quiet, and look inside themselves and realize they are, okay? Once I started to get to that point, I realized it's me. You know, it's me. And that, that's that's what did it for me. I started to realize like, no, 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 no. There's not this abstract thingy out here. Yeah, It was me. And then science. I started getting into like, why do we believe it all? What is the science behind it? How do animals act? Are we as superstitious, superstitious as other creatures? And that's when I started listening to like uh, Michael Shermer, The Believing Brain. I read Why We Believe in Gods by um, – I'm supposed to actually interview him again. I can't remember his name. I'd have to search it. But anyway, would you want to comment? No, that's a, a really good what you just said. Like, I mean, we have to – I mean, it, it, like you said, from within needs to come honesty, love, compassion for other people, and not just be – not just say – everything revolves around me. We're a part of this world. So, you know, try to make the world better. If you could do your part, everyone else does their part. And that's the way it works. Like that's, it is what it is. Like it's not some 
fairy tale. It, like this is this is reality. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be all peaches and cream all the time. Like it's it is what it is. You know. Absolutely. This is the book I was saying. Why we believe in gods. Uh, and I actually have Dr. Thompson's uh, number. I need to contact him again to set up another interview. This one, he did a PowerPoint presentation breaking down what goes on in the brain. He compares it to other examples we can give evidence for, for why we believe in God or gods. And this is approaching it scientifically. And then he's encouraged me to contact other people who take an approach showing the science behind believing and what's behind it, why we why we believe in anything at all, what, what is going on in our brains that make us do those things. Highly recommend that book as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Indo, thank you for that super chat, my friends. I seriously appreciate that. The light bulbs are going off. Endo Amen. At, endo at the endo. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, dude. I, uh, <laughs> people are like, dude, uh, I get a lot of comments from um, time to time from people who used to speak in tongues. And they're like, Derek, you actually do sound like that's because I'm not making this up. I legit spoke in tongues. I really did this at church. And I believed in, in speaking in tongues when I was by myself as often as I could remember to build up my faith because Paul says it. So it's like, and bro, like I would just go and, and you would sing to it, do all that crazy nutty stuff that you do. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. Yeah. It's the, spirit. <laughs> it's the Holy spirit. Absolutely. And uh, last one, Madalia, love both of your channels. You both have helped me in not feeling alone Appreciate in that. my curiosity for truth. Your content is amazing. Thank you both. Truly Madalia. Thank you. Yeah. Seriously. And you're not alone. Um, you know, message us anytime you need to, anytime you want to talk. If you have any questions, seriously, appreciate the support. We really appreciate that. For everybody who's checking this out, the whole video was me and Neil. Let me pop up his YouTube. Neil, tell them what your plans are with this channel and how they can help support you. Gnostic Informant, I got James Tabor coming down. That's probably tomorrow. Uh, I got some good interviews coming coming up, um, some good scholars on the on, on this on the calendar, but um, yeah, just gonna keep bringing more content, keep bringing more videos on ancient history and the Bible, on science, philosophy, all that good stuff. It's all mm. coming. Wow, man, you've produced more than I thought you did. Like Myth Vision <laughs> Junior, that's what it is. Uh, man, you never know. You might you might actually grow bigger than me. Um, you're doing different things, so I hope you do. I want to see you. I encourage it. I want you to be out there because then one day, man, who's going to help me get promoted? You know, you got to help me out, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madalia. Also, um, he has the Patreon. If you want to support his work, you can and you can message him as well if you want to help him out there. What do you have on your Patreon right now? That's uh, I know you're doing new things and you're, you're planning on doing more. You got early access. You get behind the scenes. You get to message me and talk to me. You get we get the connection going, you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So are you going to have like secret rituals of drinking the blood and eating the, uh, okay. It's, there's levels, there's levels. Yeah. There's levels. Okay, there's cool. Inner, inner, inner esoteric and the exoteric. And then, then there's the inner, inner, the holy of the holies, only certain few. Know. Ooh, where's that one at? It's, it's, uh, oh, you don't have, it's something you, that you find you gotta, out. Gotta get deified first and then you can. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, we need to talk about that because uh, <laughs> I definitely am interested in it. Uh, also, I have the Patreon. Countless videos. I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I say this number. I'm a, man, I, I'm a member. I'm a patron. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I'm not going to lie. There's probably three or 400 videos on my Patreon that have not made it onto YouTube. I won't lie when I say 100 to 150 of them are probably Bob Price. Nice. So like you, you have to dig deep. You have to go down here, load more a ton of times, but you will get there. And there is so much content. I have of Elaine Pagels. I have Delcy Allison Jr. I have Joel Baden, John J. Collins. I have, uh, you name it right now, Lester L. Graby. Uh, just academic after acti- academic after academic on my Patreon. If you want to help out, feel free to. Neil, what would you say to someone out there right now who watched this, who's maybe struggling in the middle, like they, they want to explore, but they're afraid. What would you say to them? I would say you have to attain. 
true gnosis. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean by true gnosis? I mean, like when you say that, like, what do you I, mean? I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of joking, but you know, just fo- don't have a dogmatic, don't have a stance. Don't try to f- make something true. Try to find what is true. Try to find what is not the stance, but what is the truth? Like what is, what the truth is just follow that. And you'll, you'll see it's, it's better than you think. It is a lot of fun. I must admit there's a lot of fun. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Make sure you hit that like button, go check out Neil's YouTube channel, the Gnostic informant. We'll be doing another live sometime within the next few weeks, I'm sure. And, uh, this was a blast brother. I hope we can do this again. I loved it. Definitely. And never forget, we are Myth Vision. And? And you have just attained true gnosis. Don't any of you have that guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game.